Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to start the afternoon proceedings. So, assuming that you have one, I'd be grateful if you'd take a seat um, or arrange yourselves however you are. Uh, I should just explain, in case you're wondering what on earth's happened, I'm John Durant, I'm the director of the MIT Museum. I'm just going to take this opportunity with John Oxendorf's permission to say a welcome on our own behalf in the museum to uh, the Morningside uh, Design Academy. We are so thrilled to have you all here. It's great to see this space being used for the kinds of deliberation that it was designed for. Uh, we hope you're enjoying yourselves. And I hope later on today, if you haven't already, you take a few minutes to just go and explore some of the galleries. They're on both the floors that this space occupies. Uh, do dip into them and take a look at some of the things on display with only one uh, exception. They're all new. Uh, they are not brought from the old museum. And uh, there's a lot of design in there. Guess what? In fact, the first display we have in Essential MIT in that gallery on this floor as you came up the grand stair, the first exhibit is about design uh, work going on at MIT. You might notice as well there's a lot of art in this museum. Often visitors are surprised because very often they don't realize how big MIT is in the arts as well as in technology. And guess what you get if you cross art with technology? One of the things you get, I think, is design. So uh, really a big welcome from us. Enjoy the rest of the day. And now I'll do what I'm supposed to do, which is to introduce your real chair for this session. Um, she is the Apollo Program Professor of Astronautics and the McVicker Faculty Fellow in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. But she is also, as you all know, director of the MIT Media Lab. Please welcome Professor David Newman. Thank you. Thank you. I have one. I, think you've got one on. I have one. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? This has been an amazing day. I am uh, more excited than I ever thought I could be. Uh, what a great celebration. And we have a wonderful panel. We're going to have a lot of fun, all right? That's the goal of, of our panel. Um, because we're going to talk about design and society the big questions. So just to, to preempt that as I get ready to introduce our incredible panel, I wanted to um, make just three points. I think we should think about um, design as being uh, as inclusive as we can and in, very, in infinite combinations, right? I love this saying, infinite diversity and infinite combinations. So I want us to think about designing for everyone because that's society. And secondly, I've spent uh, a lot of my uh, career thinking about, as, as an engineering professor, thinking about, are there elements of design that, are there common elements of design that scale? Because that's what I think we're here about, Morningside Academy of Design. We really are going to have design across all of MIT. So it's for everyone, but then are there commonalities? Um, I have some thoughts on that, and we're going to maybe debate that with uh, some of the great talks you have coming up. Um, usually there's problem definition, right, and constraints. Um, about design, we've talked a lot about design thinking today. What's that process of design thinking? Always visualization and reasoning comes into the picture. Our modeling, approximation, but scaling. So our panel is also going to really hit on how can we scale. It was a great question actually at the end of the last panel. So we'll take that up a little bit. And always uncertainty, right? So thinking about decision making, design for everyone, and the uncertainty <coughs> that goes with that. So those are some possible elements of design. We can debate them. We can talk about them. And then wanted to mention also to kick this off um, some successful experiments. Because at MIT, uh, we do a lot of experiments. And I think for the Morningside Academy of Design, that's what we're going to do. We are going to be unleashed to try this, to try that. Let's try a lot of experiments so that we can really get this right. Again, designing for, for all. A few of my favorite um, experiments, uh, I think, that have gone pretty well on campus uh, from the engineering life cycle aspect is kind of conceive, design, implement, operate, that whole life cycle. But that's more of an engineering take on it. Uh, another kind of model, if you will, that I, I'm really fond of from John C. Lee Brown is playing. We've heard a lot about creativity and play today. So just starting with playing and then making. 
This is a makerspace, a new MIT museum. The Media Lab is a makerspace. The Morningside Academy of Design is going to be an incredible makerspace for everyone. We just heard about you know, young kids, even pre-K, making, making and making. So playing, making, and then that brings about knowing, I think, or the learning and the knowledge that we really want to impart on, on everyone. So um, my final comment is then, if it's experiential, if we really are the makers and the designers of the future, then we want to learn about, we want to learn to be, and then finally, I think that third stage is becoming. Becoming, and so that might serve us well, is to think about this journey that we're on for what we do here on campus, but more importantly, what we can achieve in the academy, and then how we can um, really try to scale that up and serve society. So it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce very quickly, come back to that, our, our panelists. It's been wonderful to work with them all just to, just to tee this up. So first you're gonna hear from Svava Gronfeld, okay, Svava? <laughs> Professor of the Practice in the School of Architecture uh, and Planning. And she's a faculty director of uh, what we call Design X. You're gonna hear some about that and some amazing uh, latest uh, results. Michael Murphy has joined us, so glad to have you join us. Michael, thanks so much. He's the Thomas um, Ventilla Chair of Architecture at Georgia Institute of Technology, newly named. Congratulations, Michael, thanks so much for joining us. We're joined by Patrick Whitney. Thank you, Patrick, for joining us. Professor in residence at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Steelcase Endowed Chair and Dean Emeritus from IIT, the Illinois Institute of Technology. And then we have a colleague, close friend, uh, Crystalla Jones Prather. Chris is the Arthur D. Little um, professor in the MIT Department of Chemical Engineering. And she's also the executive officer, and that's a hard job, so we can thank her just for that. <laughs> so uh, they're all gonna give um, comments, and then we uh, think about your questions, and we have some, some questions teed up so that we can have a spectacular panel. Svava, I invite you for your presentation. Okay, hello everyone. I feel like I'm about to defend my thesis. <laughs> you know, this room is amazing and I'm so happy and honored to be here, so thank you for including me. Uh, but what I'm going to attempt to do today is to talk about maybe what is happening behind the scenes of all these beautiful success stories you saw today. How is design contributing to solving these complex problems? So I come from a program, like Deva was saying, it's called DesignX, uh, where we get to work with students from across the institute. They're engaging super complex problems like social injustice, climate change, public health issues and the like. And um, we get to work with them and support them as they deploy their solutions out into the world. But we also want to make sure that whatever methods and, and, and means we have here also find its way out side of the, the privilege of this institution. So uh, we have about 3,000 people per year who go through DesignX related activities. So, but I'm gonna start by kind of ruining your day. <laughs> this is uh, data on how enormously difficult it is to actually take a solution and deploy it into the world. So we have data showing 70 to 95% of new solutions failing to meet users' expectations. We have nine out of 10 uh, new companies uh, failing in their first three to five years. And out of those who survive, only one in 200 seem to manage to scale at the rate that they envisioned they would do for the desired impact they wanted to have. So, of course, we were naturally curious, you know, why the heck is that, <laughs> you know? And we wanted to figure out how might design kind of work in this environment. So what we did is we decided to speak to uh, designers and non-designers alike, and we asked them this very innocent question, how do you engage super complex problems? And we, of course, talked to um, colleagues all across the Institute. Uh, many of you are here, thank you. Uh, but then we also talk to people who are amounting Arctic expeditions, um, people who are working in nuclear power plants, people who are trying to solve the European energy crisis at the moment, and so on and so forth. 
But we also wanted to see what history has to tell us. So we were looking at the historical cases where design through the decades actually has been deployed to, to help solve, these, solve super complex problems. But we were mostly interested in what are the next generation of creatives and founders doing in terms of engaging these problems, which we, unfortunately, humans, we have created mostly for ourselves. So what are they doing to engage those, and how are they deploying design to, to, to um, attack those issues? So what you see here is a very traditional way of looking at innovation. We have an idea, we think about it, we stay in the lab or the studio for a long time, we develop it, and then only to find out as we come out that there was no need for it. And there is data coming out every year on this here in the US saying that up to half, between 42 and 50% half, and of new companies fail because they do exactly this. And the rest fail because their, their solutions were poorly designed. So how might we do if we turn it the other way around? And we do all that squiggly squiggly in the beginning rather than in the end. So, we see that um, by doing this, by having the humility to actually listen, to have the humility to design with people, even like we heard today, designed by people, we see that the teams who do that and take the time to really engage to see if there is a problem to be solved. And if so, who is the best equipped to solve that problem? And we see that the teams who do that, they, they launch what we call more informed concepts and they have more uh, smooth deployment out into the world. But this in itself isn't new. Human-centered design, design thinking, we've been doing this for decades, right? But when it comes to super complex problems, which we have created by being really, really created by being really focused on the humans, we are talking about a whole different ballgame. So the people we talked to, they were really uh, focused on the fact that the way we engage complex problems today is really counterintuitive to, to creative problem solving and is really inhabiting the very essence of innovation. Because what we do is we tend to take these complex problems, because we're human, we try to kind of pare them down into these manageable pieces and methodically solve one by one by one while we well know that the nature of our lives today is not like that. So what we find out is that once we get one part of the problem, the rest is forever changed. So we are talking about multiple threats that need to be woven into this tapestry of, of sustainable solutions. Sustainable solutions. So we cannot only focus on the human. We have to focus on the context of innovation and entrepreneurship. It's a very powerful way to scale solutions we have to take into consideration at least these four. This is still work in progress. We did about 80 interviews, but we're still kind of, you know, continuing to do those. But these four are kind of merging out of those interviews that we need to integrate technology and human needs, but not only human needs, we also need to take into consideration non-human stakeholders like nature. And then of course, in the context of innovation and entrepreneurship, economy uh, and economic factors are necessary. And as we move through time and space, this, of course, changes. So this is what we kind of envision this to be. So all these multiple actors kind of fluently working together, having to seamlessly go through these different threads. And we were really super interested to know, where does design fit in? What is all the interesting stories that you have been hearing about today come in? And if you take a look with me into one of these little blue dots, this is what you see. So what designers do super well is we can envision a future. We can draw a picture of the future. And like uh, one of our colleagues, I think he's in here, um, Marcelo, he's here somewhere. He said it so beautifully. He said, design allows us to see a world that doesn't really exist. Design allows us to see a future that doesn't really exist. What he meant by that is that we can paint that picture and we can do all that squiggly thingy that I was showing you before, before we actually deploy. And then what our interviewees all said is that when design is engaged in complex problems, we are entering it with, through an iterative process, through elastic and multi-scalar approach, working on small things and big things at the same time. But we also are visual. So it allows us to see something that hasn't been created. 
saving time and money. So this, in its essence, allows us to flow with complexity rather than fight complexity. And that's what designers do super well. We have a future. We have a picture of the future. We may have no idea how to get there, but we have that picture in our minds. And we go through, we have the courage to explore and to engage and empathize and reimagine and reframe and reframe and reframe the problem until we have a solid foundation for a solution. So design does not have all the answers by no means. We need to push the boundaries of science. We need to push the boundaries of technology. But design, we believe, has a role to play in this. And this is kind of what we imagine it might look like. And um, Sigi um, Thorstensson, who is a design uh, group, uh, he is a the, what is he? He's a chief design officer. That's what he is. At, um, in Milan, he talks about the necessity for choreography, for orchestration, because otherwise this just goes in circle, just goes in circle. So we need to have intuition and soft skills. And you've been hearing about it all day, about diverse teams. That is the soft skill piece of this and the imagination. But also all our uh, interviewees mentioned ethics, that all of this has to be designed for good. So this is kind of how we see this. We see design. One of the roles of design is to help choreograph this path, a meaningful path to help make sense of the world. And we already see it with these beautiful young creators of new companies coming out of MIT who are making a meaningful difference. Not only are they creating hundreds and hundreds of jobs, but they're now just three to five years after graduation. Some of these teams, I'm not going to go into it here. Maybe we talk more about it in the Q&A. But they're serving over 100 million people today, three to five years after graduation. So that's a, a meaningful way to spend one's life. And uh, we longingly refer to this as venture design. So with that, I think my time is up. And I hand it over to my colleagues. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, Slava, unbelievable. I love the new choreography. There's so much in there that we get to, to ask you about more. Thanks for teeing up your, your latest results. Michael, you're next. Again, on the theme of design for society. Wait till you see his amazing work. Thank you for uh, inviting me here. Thank you, John and Deva, and congratulations on this new incredible center. Uh, excited to be back here. Excited to see everyone sitting next to each other, um, not six feet apart. Uh, I think um, we've learned a lot in the last two years through this pandemic. And I thought I could spend a little time talking about that and what I've kind of pulled from that as a designer. I think we've on some grounding of why design matters so much to all of us and what we can do to improve people's lives more broadly. You know, as an architect, uh, we saw a lot of spatial rejiggering of our built environment during the pandemic. And we saw t people talking about that distance and seeing the floor plans and, and the arrows about how to separate each other. Um, but as an architect, you also realize that it wasn't so much about the distance between people that we were designing for, it was the volume of air around people that we actually had to design our world around. And that six feet rule was really a spatial hack, one that tr kind of transformed the, the entire globe, um, but didn't get to the core principle necessarily that it was the volume of air that was moving around us that we had to think about critically to make visible that invisible uh, volumetric reality that was shaping and affecting all of our lives and still is today. Um, if there's one thing I learned from the pandemic or was kind of reinforced and proven to me, it's that our buildings uh, don't breathe anymore, and they keep us from breathing. If it's uh, the windows in your house that no longer open, or that kind of soulless office bay that gets no light and air, uh, or the new residential uh, tower or community next to the highway or the factory, uh, these are the spaces where we spend 90% of our entire lives inside of uh, infrastructure, architecture, inside of buildings. Um, and it is literally, these spaces are literally keeping us from breathing fresh, uncontaminated air. So the question is, of course, can we design a future where we are not only allowed the privilege to breathe again, but our buildings breathe again? Um, can we design our entire built environment post-pandemic to breathe again and breathe better? 
Uh, the answer, of course, is yes, we can. We can both retrofit and, and redesign. If we think about guiding principles like breathing as cross-sectorally adjusting and, and shaping every built environment decision that we make, it's not just about affecting our health. Here is proof that our health is directly impacted by the buildings around us. It's our ability to breathe and uh, equitably breathe. Um, I think there's precedent for this. It's not only can we do this in the future, there's precedent we did this in the past. In fact, it wasn't that long ago. This is, of course, the great Florence Nightingale in the 19th century. Uh, Nightingale had a hunch that the air in hospitals was making people sicker. And she studied this amazing uh, hospital designed by the great engineer Isambard Kingdom Brunel, uh, the Renkoy Hospital built during the Crimean War. And it was designed around airflow. It had uh, light and air and, dis and decontamination as its guiding principles. And the rates of soldiers that were dying of disease dropped by an astonishing 70% because of this hospital. It's an astonishing number, 70%. Uh, it was the design of the hospital that literally saved their lives. And it convinced Nightingale that uh, hospital design or building design is not uh, a pile of stones or rocks or braced wood, um, but is uh, a, mecha a mechanism that could shape and improve our lives. It's a medical device. And for that, she then published that into Notes on Hospital, published in 1859, and really shaped a century of architecture and built environment uh, around the idea of breathability. She shaped not just hospitals, she shaped schools as well. You may know after the Spanish uh, influenza in 1919, the outdoor school movement uh, blossomed and uh, schools were literally designed to have operable walls. This was something uh, many of us argued for, I'll talk about that in a second, during the last pandemic and were, had a lot of resistance. Uh, putting students outside was really the safest strategy to reduce infection rates uh, and there was plenty of precedent both after the pandemic but also in the mid-century. Uh, of course, the factories uh, that we see throughout the uh, US, and um, in particular, there's Mass Mocha or Barbara Ernst Prey's watercolor of it. Pre-electricity -elect, pre uh, and mechanical systems, of course, these were designed to get light and air deep into the floor plate. So the fenestration was a big piece of that design. Even the Gamble House, if you look back at the history of this early uh, modern work, uh, is about healing infrastructure, about getting the cure, as they called it. Of course, this all changes uh, in the mid-century when um, you know, we changed as a society and, and mechanical systems were much more prevalent. Uh, we had this new indoor air uh, conditioning and uh, it was uh, much more affordable and, and made its way into many more buildings. Uh, breathing was now controlled by ducts and air shafts uh, and the indoor climate became circulated mechanically. Of course, the result of this is that building sizes grew enormous uh, and the hallway becomes the oper operational device uh, to allow uh, us to move through them, becoming longer, darker, and of course more congested and more contaminated. Uh, this was uh, my experience when I was a student um, of architecture at the GSD up the road, studied with our good uh, chair, Dean here, uh, Hashem Sarkis. And um, my father, who was sick with cancer, was rushed to the hospital when I was uh, a first year student. Um, while they did save his life, um, or extend his life, I, I could not ignore the kind of lack of uh, design of the spaces of his hospitalization. This was the, the clinic floor that we were in. And on the right, uh, that's Bellevue from New York uh, with that kind of never-ending labyrinth of a hallway. And it kind of really struck me as a, as a young design student, like asking these questions, these are the most important places where we tra transition from life to death, where we might bring in new life of great joy and also lose life. These transitional spaces, where was the design? these most important places in our life. Where was the light? Where was the air? Uh, where was the dignity in these spaces? I couldn't help but think, you know, we, we must be able to design less suffocating experiences, uh, in, in, especially in the most important places in where we transition through our lives. And the answer is, of course we can, but the challenges are, are severe to do so. But after the pandemic, I think, I feel more urgency as a designer that we can push a public narrative that these spaces must, we deserve uh, nothing less than spaces that fight for our own dignity and fight for our own ability to breathe again in the society around us. Of course, I think there's a lot of good examples of where this is happening really positively. Heather Wick's incredible center, cancer center uh, in, in Leeds uh, is a great example of where you're literally bringing the indoors, uh, the outdoors inside the building. I wished uh, my family and I could have had my father's cancer treatment in a place like this. 
Um, I love to look back at uh, the great Charles Correa's uh, Kanchanganga uh, Tower, which of course was designed around natural ventilation and pushing, like really driving air through these residential units because of the innovative use of this double height um, exterior um, uh, patio in each of, these, uh, each of these units. And of course, we might not look even further than just the kind of incremental reappropriation of, this, of the street uh, during the pandemic to, to show that designing around breathing uh, where restaurants couldn't serve indoors literally changed our everyday life and improved our cities and the public right in front of us. This is happening every day um, and, and continues to sort of reimagine the city around us. So too, we might think that breathing as an operational strategy and guide uh, becomes a way for us to demand a built environment that serves us more directly. In my work at the organization I founded, Mass Design Group, um, we've, all, we've thought about breathing from the beginning. The Batara Hospital was designed around uh, moving uh, enough air changes per hour, 12 air changes per hour, naturally without mechanical systems through this hospital in, designed in 2008 and built in 2011 uh, in order to reduce the transmission of diseases like tuberculosis. But that same airflow movement strategy of course, is directly applicable to COVID. Um, but even in recent projects like this uh, re um, reimagination of this old historic factory in my hometown of Poughkeepsie, New York, um, we are uh, where the old factory windows were bricked in to allow for mechanical systems to be inserted, just the reopening of that fenestration, just the, um, just the kind of reuse of the historic frames allows us to get enough airflow into the center that we can have a fully naturally ventilated um, uh, office space um, that uh, offers some new innovative strategies uh, without a centralized mechanical system within it. Here's, here's that standard gauge building with the big windows that were bricked in. Here you can see it um, today and what we're reimagining it under construction, uh, some other examples before and after. Finally, I just wanted to point out that we also did this at MIT when we, uh, John Oxendorf and, and I and Sarah Carr taught a studio during the pandemic to have the students uh, here think about rethinking the, the Cambridge City School District buildings themselves. Every student looked at one school uh, and said, what would we, how do we study it to understand how it's getting enough airflow? What could be brought outside? How could we advocate for policy change inside of Cambridge? Uh, through, the, through the study of the students, uh, and, and what would we need to do to redesign them so these could be breathable school buildings once again. Um, it created an incredible um, series of strategies uh, that were then you know, given over to the Cambridge City School District and a recent publication on, on schools that breathe with my co-teachers and uh, Anna McIntosh, one of the students. You know, I think the result of thinking of, about breathability, not just healing and health, but breathability, uh, the result's not just better buildings. You, know, you, you see people, I see people changing. I see patients who sigh with relief in, in hospitals. This is the Niragenge Hospital we finished in Rwanda recently. I see workers who feel seen and supported. Uh, and I see a public that's starting to demand more from the built environment around them. I think the pandemic will be a hinge point for all of us, but in particular in architecture and design, We've all felt the fear of suffocation from being in spaces. We've all felt the indignity of the buildings that are not designed for our needs. But we've also witnessed um, the possibility of a redemption. We've witnessed a window. We've opened a window into really a better world we could, be, um, we could demand as a public and build. So to improve, I think, our general ability to breathe, but also a more equitable breathing that could happen in our society, even to solve the climate crisis, which is directly related to this, of course, I think we must do three things. We must do what Nightingale did and really see the buildings around us as living devices. I think the public uh, must change uh, the spaces around them to think about that volume of air and demand that it be moving in a way that prioritizes their health and the health of their colleagues and family. And then I think we in the design and architecture community could be focusing on the narrative strand around breathability as a fundamental driving force that could shape the next era of buildings in front of us. I don't think we really have much of a other choice. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Michael. That was great. Um, so important uh, yeah, to breathe, to be together, and convene and designing, again, with that dignity and for, for all folks. I think to keep a little bit in that, in that um, theme now, we'll hear from Patrick. Thank you very much. Uh, still 
about health and wellness and designing for society and with society. Thank you. How many in the room are designers? How many in the room are from MIT? Okay, great. Um, there's an interesting um, thread going through the conversation about who designs, co-design, uh, everyone's a designer. And uh, in the panel on education, it was interesting because uh, 10 years ago, that conversation wouldn't have happened because design was imprisoned in the departments of art and design. And the standard degree was four years. You took very few liberal arts courses or technical courses. You were isolated into a ridiculously small field. It didn't seem that way to students at the time, but um, well, have things changed? Um, the, um, fundamentally, design is about making and using. And um, this morning, um, someone was talking about the joy of um, making something. Uh, maybe that was this afternoon. Um, the, how proud one felt when one made something. Making is. Uh, we are um, taught by advertising and public relations that happiness comes from owning new things. But we know that's a lie. More happiness comes from making things, things that we're proud about. The um, close relationship between makers and users uh, started to die around 1851 is a good time to pick as a um, time when we noticed it, that was the Crystal Palace exhibition, which celebrated mass production, mass markets, mass retail delivery. And it started to separate the makers and users. Before that, makers and users were either the same person or they lived down the street from each other. We've passed into a different class of uh, design problems, the big problems we have, um, global warming, um, where to put this, where to get material for all the stuff, products we need, where do we put all those products when we've uh, used them all. Uh, one more question for you. How many people in this room have a drawer or a shelf filled with little cameras and little phones that are still usable? Yeah. I, I believe that human-centered design and our belief in innovation have done more to harm the environment of the world than almost any other activity. I think that we, uh, when we adopted the word human-centered design, which wasn't that long ago, does anyone here want to venture a guess what came before human-centered design? What the big topic was? What was on the covers of magazines and conferences? It was designed for manufacturing. America had dropped the quality of manufactured goods, and there was a huge effort, Six Sigma, total quality management, to get management back in there. We didn't talk about people. They were referred to as oh, them, you know, in planning meetings. Um, Human-centered design was sparked by us putting chips in stuff, um, putting Chips in typewriters created word processors, which were terrible things. You needed training to use them. It took a long time before personal computer software caught up. Um, we hold that there's a problem in design in that we are thought, thought, of it, thought that it is a process, a process where you define the problem, where you investigate it, you redefine the problem, perhaps. You make prototypes, you test it, and you launch, and then you hope it works, hope people buy it. That's only half the story. The half that we're missing is the, not the process side of design, but the content side of design. The content is what to make. 
Uh, what terrains do users live in? What territories do companies claim to go and uh, get the work with the uh, users in the uh, territories? Where does value get created? How to make it? What business are we in? And we're presenting this as a content model for, for design. Now, scale is an interesting issue. Um, I'm going to talk about it in three or four ways. Um, I'm going to start by talking about mistakes that senior execs make. These are senior execs. These are mistakes caused by the pressure of mass production and mass marketing. They want delivery date and, pro and proof of success before you start work. How many designers in the room have suffered from that? How many come across come, come people who are so enamored by being precise that they'll do something that they think is wrong, they believe is wrong, rather than go forward with something that's roughly right? It's worse to not be definitive than it is to be wrong. There's a problem with that. And then there are the execs who want mind-bending breakthrough innovations as long as it doesn't require any change in the organization. They're mixed up about the fact that problems come in different sizes and different scales. And we're going to talk a little bit about this. This is Marty Cooper. He invented the cell phone. He, those are prototypes of, those aren't prototypes. Those are prototypes of the first phone. And the black one with the white keys by his right hand is the first phone. Um, heroic effort in inventing that thing. He was a uh, graduate of IIT and he uh, uh, worked at Motorola. That phone in the middle was the, made Motorola a heroic company. They were the, almost like the apple of their day. They would go to uh, conferences and throw the phone up in the air and it would hit the ground and they would pick it up and they'd make a call. It was unbreakable. <laughs> and the sound was getting better and better every month. Nokia, on the right, stuck colored skins on the front of the phones. They let you put colored skins on top of the phones. They had, they had analog sound, which wasn't as good, digi digital sound, which wasn't as good. And they were, oh, and if you dropped them, they broke. And Motorola couldn't understand why those things, which were lower technical quality, didn't look as good, and broke, uh, if you dropped them, were, were killing them. And what they didn't get is people were happy when their phone broke because it had changed from a, from a tool for work for a tool that was cool. And you wanted a new one. You didn't want it to last a long time. This brings us to um, one of our central principles, uh, the innovation gap. The innovation gap didn't exist until the early part of the 20th century. That's when knowing how to make something, why to make it, what it, what it should be, and who is it for were aligned. Those split apart. And we know, continue to know more and more by, um, about how and why things were made. But we, know le we knew less about people, because they were living a more varied life. And if you don't know about people, you don't know what to design. So people, I had the president of Motorola, Bob Growney, come to me at a trustee meeting and say, Patrick, our problem is we can make any phone you can imagine. You, you describe or specify the phone, we know how to make it. Our problem is we don't know which phone to make. Of the 90, of the 90 options that they have for the, that they could make this year, which two are they going to decide to build? They can't do all of them. This has created a drop in certainty that uh, David talked about. Uh, 
Companies don't know what to do. It gets worse when you realize that your employees are distracted. We discovered a new disease called RDD. And as Adobe and 3D printing teach us how to make things faster and cheaper, and Google teaches us to find things, and the web takes us sharing, we lost something called downtime. We, did, we, we treated it as a negative. Downtime was something we were waiting for. Um, in the consulting world, downtime came at 9 o'clock, because that was the last FedEx pickup. You could go home and not have to keep working. Can't do that anymore. There's no downtime left. We suffer from reflection deficit disorder. How many of you feel you have enough information in your life now? How many want more information? You lose. It's a very different answer than I got in the, um, the saucer in Beijing, the Opera House. There were 3,000 people at a graphic design congress. And I said, how many of you want more information? How many of you want more information in your life? And about 300 hands went up, out of 3,000 people. And then I said, how many of you want more information in your um, How many of you want more information in your life? And there, no one wanted more, more information. 10 years earlier, had I asked that question, everyone wanted more information. Before the web, everyone wanted more information. The web fixed that. There's another issue we have to deal with. Those of you who are science fans, and I assume everyone in this room is, believe in this, um, this list on the left, where you start with data, and you move to information, and move to knowledge, move to wisdom, and from that you get meaning. That's, all, that's uh, Fauci arguing for taking, following the science of vaccinations. 45 million people in this country are over on this side. They find meaning not in facts and science, and, but they find meaning in what they read on Facebook or what they, the news they see on the web. We've got a problem. This is what's causing the lack of trust in the country, and we need to fix it. People in this room, Tim Berners-Lee works here, doesn't he? And he, I believe, is working on a second version of the web, which doesn't make the genetic code of it information about you so they can sell you more stuff, but information that you would want to know that you can go get. Jared Lanier is working with the um, founder of uh, um, virtual reality is working on figuring out what the value of personal information is that people should be paid for. This is one of the things designers do. They abstract from the real. So that's an MP3 player before the iPod. They could have made an MP3 player um, we could have made the iPod, but instead they abstracted it to enjoying music, and they created iTunes and the digital rights management and sold music by the song instead of the album. And for better or worse, they changed the industry. I'm going to uh, talk to you about another design skill that can, um, is specifically relevant to scale. This is an observation project that my colleague, Andre Noguera, who's here, and I did uh, when the pandemic sh shut down all other research activities that required traveling. We put together a team in each one of these cities, and gave them a protocol for observing people in their daily life during the lockdown when they couldn't leave home. We wanted to see what it was. And by giving them the same protocol, by making them do the ethnography in exactly the same way. No, no added creativity in that, but they followed the rules. We were able to get common information from 23 cities, 17 universities, 1,200 homes, in which we got 12,000 micro stories. 
These are stories they told us. They told the teams in there. We didn't travel anywhere during any of this. And um, what the, we did with these micro stories, this is a demo that's going to go very fast, 15 seconds. Um, we took the information from various stories. So there were 1,200 of stories like this. I'm just showing you two. Gathered, created the micro stories by analyzing things people said, uh, put it into software where you could find patterns, and you could explore those patterns, and then you could go back to the data. So we couldn't have done this using normal ethnographic processes. What, what's the largest ethnographic, observational ethnographic, not questionnaires, a person has done uh, in, in here? Who feels they've done anything that approaches that size? I, I think this might be the largest design ethnography ever done. So gathering data, finding micro stories, variables, finding them, seeing the relationships between them, seeing different patterns, and when you see one you like, getting back into the data that caused it. It's tools like that that need a theory of, need to be underpinned by a theory of observation and how to work that we need to do if we're going to do design at scale. This is a project that we're uh, exploring. It's a pilot project now funded by the Gates Foundation about economic development in India, particularly helping women start small businesses. Um, the things it takes us to explore are things we, we, we're exploring things we never thought we would be doing at all. The diagram at the bottom, the dark blue line shows the growth of charity, standard charity over the years. The blue, bright blue line shows the growth of economic development programs, not money that they would just give people to use on food and medicine, but help them with job training or starting small businesses. We're proposing an exponential development program where we don't base the business idea on the limitations of the village. We base the business idea on the aspirations of the user, of the, of the villager, not the user. And we expect it to be profitable, not just sustaining. And we're putting in the audacious goal of ending poverty in rural parts of India. This, um, we're using this model called the whole view model as the basis for the work. We're asking key questions like, why does this create value? How to make it? What businesses are we in? Who is it for? What to make? If you add this content model to the normal process model of design, it's amazing how fast you can go because the, locals, the local villagers or the local executives, if we do it in the States, know a lot about their company. They just don't know how to organize it in a the, in the way that works. Um, so this leads us to... Um, to a, uh, a series of challenges. We face these challenges in, about how to make things and use things. We have to decide if we really want carbon-free objects, environments, and services. Are we going to tame the organizations and machines that produce more stuff for people who already have too much stuff? Can the initial price of a product include the cost of extracting materials needed to build it and the cost of disposing it when we're finished using it? Are we going to stop thinking of people as units of production and units of consumption and instead think of them as humans that bring love and joy to families and friends? Any of these challenges seem hard to answer together, but they're daunting. The scale of the challenges calls for audacious solutions. Creating this, this design academy is an audacious attempt. Um, Gerald, what's your level of certainty that this is going to work? <laughs> 100%. If I asked you that before you gave the money, would it have been a different number, a different answer? Um, we need audacious solutions. So where are the agents to create these audacious changes? They're in this room. They're in this university. It's the university's job to be wrong in many cases, 
and to get to do, to, in order to get to do the big thing that's right. The creation of the Morningside Academy is an audacious start for, meetings with, for meeting these challenges. We'll see new ways of working coming out of MIT. You're going to see um, design knowledge and abilities infecting the rest of the university with a good virus. And uh, it's going to, um, we're going to, I believe design is going to turn to paying attention more to the meaning of things and not just the presumed benefit imagined by a client. So uh, let's all get together and join this new phase of design and make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for um, challenging us uh, to think about meaning and also reflecting. The reflection deficit disorder. I'll remember that one. I think we'll all remember that one. Okay, so now we're going to be joined by Chris Prather from thinking about design for society and bringing in nature and biology and cellular design. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, I'm going to talk to you about biology and I'm going to sneak in some chemistry as well. And my task over the next few minutes is to convince you that I was invited for some other reason than my friendship with John and Maria and Deva. Uh, I use a lot of pictures, actually, when I talk about biology and design and biology, especially for an audience of designers, which uh, all of you are, because I think it helps us to think about, or at least it helps me to think about this connection between intentional design, which is my objective as an engineer, uh, and natural design, which is what we see in the world all around us. And I don't have anything to say about these specific pictures, but rather just want you to think about what it means for these structures to exist in the natural world, um, these structures that have texture, these structures that have color, these structures that have function. And so that's one image for you in terms of how to think about design in the context of biology. For my own work, we have a different perspective when we think about biology for design, and we are actually interested in the use of biology to do chemistry. Patrick in his talk talked about prior to human-centered design, there was design for manufacturing, and we actually have a focus on manufacturing, but that manufacturing context is centered around biology, and in particular around the idea, really the reality, it's not an idea, the reality that biology is just chemistry. What I have shown here is an image of a representation of metabolism, which is all of the reactions, the chemical reactions that happen inside of a cell. They're happening inside of you and me, even as we're sitting here and standing here and connecting with each other. And they represent form and function in biological systems that allow us to move as humans, that allow plants to have those structures that I showed you before, and importantly, actually allow us to have access to chemical structures that have turned out to be very beneficial for our lives. I've shown here two examples of uh, molecular structures that are therapeutics. On the left-hand side, the first cholesterol-lowering drug that was ever developed, and on the right, a more recent anti-infective. So medicines that have actually proven very critical, um, along with the design of hospitals, to be able to prolong human life. There are other structures, other chemical structures, that have utility that are less about therapeutics and less about human health, but more about providing us with quality of life, for giving us uh, access to materials that give us the kinds of structures that we see around us and allow us to operate in this space. What's true about this, these chemical molecules, what's true about the first set of pictures I showed you, which are about biology with form and function, is that it really all comes back down to DNA, that we are composed of DNA, that anything living is composed of a DNA. And so just as the green leaves, the shape and the color and the structure there are influenced by DNA, so are the small molecules, the chemical structures that we've been able to extract from biological systems that have had such a profound effect on human health and well-being, uh, and really on quality of life. And so I'm a chemical engineer by training. What I think about is how do I actually do chemistry using biology and DNA is the template by which I'm able to manifest design, to be able to specify a certain sequence of nucleic acids, a certain sequence of these letters, A's and G's and C's and T's that you've no doubt heard about, that then through a process of molecular interactions result in new structures and new functions. 
And so for us, we really think about how do we bring chemistry and biology together into the design space where our objective is to make new molecules and to make new materials and to have those materials be useful for humans. Um, it is a little bit of a, of a human-centric way of thinking about it, um, but it's also an environmental way of thinking about it, which I'll come back to uh, in a few minutes. So I, I promise I'm not gonna have a lot of data slides. Um, this is just to give you a sense of how the design progression has evolved as we've thought about our ability to take advantage of uh, the uh, technology to manipulate DNA to give us these new functions in biological systems. If you think about now that big picture I initially showed you with all those dots and lines, imagine what I have here is just a zoomed in vision, or version rather, of a small snippet where our objective is to make this compound here which is labeled D, and I have access then to technologies where I can prevent the production of things that I don't want and really improve upon the ability or the rate at which I'm going from A to D in this case to make more of what I need more efficiently to be able to provide, for example, those life-saving medicines. But if I limit my design space to what nature has already given me, it's fairly limited. It's only, uh, I'm only able to access those things that I can identify readily from nature and those things where I know how to put together those sequences there. Instead, if I imagine, again, that this DNA is a substrate upon which I can build by pulling from a diversity of biology in a number of different areas, I can do mixing and matching and pull different pieces of DNA from different pieces of biological systems and assemble those together in ways that are new to nature but still give me these important functional uh, materials that I need. And that uh, is one iteration in the design cycle where now I'm mixing and matching, but I can also think about designing those steps themselves where I may convert molecule A to molecule B. We use specialized proteins called enzymes to do that. And there's a level now of design within that to change the catalyst, to change the types of reactions that are done and allow me now to make entirely new materials that I didn't know could be made with biology, but if, as part of design, if we can imagine what could be and then chart a path to get there, we're able to take advantage of new tools and technologies to be able to bring this to fruition. So this is what we've been doing in my group. I have here just three structures. And what I'm trying to demonstrate here are two things. One is to be able to show you that we can access this design template, if you will, of nature to pull from it pieces that allow us to reassemble them together in new ways to get structures that have new functions. And we can have increasing complexity in do, to do this, meaning that we can access more and more forms of biology to bring them together. But we are really driven to do this by our desire and really an imperative to reduce the ecological footprint of chemical manufacturing. There are things that we need to survive. There are things that we want for quality of life. I agree that we probably want way more than we need, but we have to figure out how to balance those and identify ways to be able to bring into being the materials that we need while reducing the damage that we've been doing to the environment. So this is an image of what traditional petroleum refinery looks like. This is the source for the vast majority of all the materials that you see. We're used to thinking about that in the context of uh, gasoline to power our cars, and so we feel better when we buy an electric vehicle. Um, but it turns out that those power plants that are then providing electricity for your electric vehicle, they're sort of taking access or using access uh, to the same materials as well. Um, and we forget about the fibers, and we forget about the cell phone cases, and we forget about the, the textiles in our homes that are all relying upon those same materials. And these very, very large factories like this uh, have a, a central role that they play in society, um, and they are in part so large and they concentrate so much energy because they're taking as feedstock something that is not very evenly distributed across the world. So this is a map from an analysis of the US um, uh, IEA in uh, 2017 that shows the distribution of petroleum reserve, reserves across the world where the darker is more concentrated. And you can just see exactly what we know, that there are smaller concentrated pockets where this reserve exists, and it has both an environmental co uh, consequence uh, and it has a real socio-political context that's actually playing out right now uh, with geopolitical con uh, conflict. 
When we think about using biology, our vision is to be able to move further and further away from this map and recognize that if we can take advantage of what's available everywhere and not what's just available in concentrated pockets of the globe, then we can imagine smaller facilities that cause less damage, that are able to be better integrated with the environment, and that really reduce our environmental footprint while increasing our sustainability. And this then requires a level of design thinking that has a level of complexity that's far more than what we've been able to achieve before. So it represents a challenge for those of us who are working within this space to think about how do we actually really reimagine the use of biology for chemical synthesis and do it in a way where we actually can reduce the environmental footprint as well. And in particular, what I'm driven by is the idea to be able to make more use of that stuff that we normally throw away, these broken elements that we're so apt to dispose of without any consideration, and rather consider can we reutilize those, can we retool them in a way where we integrate our biological design with the manufacturing design and are able to now deploy it in a way that takes advantage of local needs that engages with local communities to determine what's needed and how to provide that in the way that's most beneficial for, for, for society at large. Uh, so I'm going to end it there um, with now a, a representation here of, of really how we think about design and bringing a design now into the chemical and biological space, but doing it in a way where we really do think about what is the impact on society and how do we actually have those societal influences work with us, talk to us, and really do this as a collaborative effort uh, to transform the way that we think about manufacturing for design. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I knew that would be amazing. Again, bringing in the biology and chemistry, and we all understood it, and it's so important for sustainability and thinking about future uh, potentiality and what we can do. So I'm going to ask all of the speakers, which are amazing, to, to uh, I guess go in this order as, as you spoke. Exactly. <laughs> and we have. Sit under um, my face. How about that? Dave? You gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to sit oh, next to you. Okay, all right. I'll go one next, one next to, to my Yeah, face. exactly. <laughs> there we go. I can sit down with you all. Great. So think of your questions. I'm going to um, start it up. And this is a question for everyone. And I'm going to start with Chris and ask what your design superpower is. <laughs> so I, I will say that. that David said she was going to ask me this. And I said, I have no idea, but I'll think of something by the time you ask me. Um, so I've been thinking about this. And, and I'm, going to, I'm going to say my design superpower uh, is perseverance, uh, stubbornness, obstinance, whatever you want to call it. Because what we are faced with over and over again in biology is the reality that the complexity is such um, that you cannot be precise in your designs. Uh, and I love the way that, that Svava talked about this in the sense of, of you, you, wanna, you know things are complex and you want to then try to, to simplify them to the point where you can have some certainty in your design. Um, and that automatically changes everything that comes after that. And this is biology. We usually call it noise. Um, but it's really a reflection of the complexity that's there. And so if you do want to do design within biology, um, you have to become really accustomed to disappointment. You have to embrace failure. Uh, you have to uh, be inspired by ignorance um, because you're challenged by those all the time. And if you can keep going in spite of that and still have something work, sometimes for reasons that are really about your design and sometimes quite accidentally for reasons that you uncover later, um, there's a lot of great things that we can do. Fantastic. I used to give an award for failure. I love it. <laughs> Patrick, your design superpower. I think what I'm good at is uh, identifying the values and abilities of different people and figuring out how to overcome those differences and get them to work together. To work together. So cultural, societal, ethnography, yeah. as you mentioned. And, and it works with organizations as well as people. Some things belong together and other things yeah. don't. Thank you. OK, Michael, you're up. I just thought, I was just thinking about this. Uh, maybe it's because um, I studied English literature before I went to design school. But I, th I think for me, the, the co core of, let's say, great architecture, great design is it tells an incredible story. And that narrative is the driving kind of um, 
operation that allows us to understand where design makes an impactful decision. So what I aspire to be is a great storyteller through design, so I would try to do that. Thank you. Slava. Yeah. Wow, this is a tough question. So I've been thinking about it. So I think, I don't think I have any superpowers, but I have like this crazy optimism. I always believe everything is going to go well. <laughs> I mean, like scary presentations are all going to go well. Um, I think that's what we need, uh, maybe through design, maybe through entrepreneurship, biology, or otherwise. We need to believe in it, I think. And if you believe, you will find a way. And this, what I love about, because I'm not trained as a designer myself, what I love about designers is this courage to constantly iterate and embrace failure. And you have to have optimism. So I think my only superpower as a designer is I'm optimistic. <laughs> Fantastic, yeah, we need to be, exactly. It's a good bookend, because I'm the same way, the eternal optimist, even through our failures. Yeah. But you know, if we can see it and envision it, and it's in your model, it's, it's kind of that centerpiece of your yeah. design framework that you served up for us. Okay, so fantastic. We're gonna, I think, um, ask for some audience questions, if we have some. And while we're doing that, I'm gonna uh, take the liberty to, to ask one more. And um, okay, here's a small question. How can we ignite a global movement of creativity? <laughs> and it's for anyone who wants to take it. <laughs> Learn from the women's self-help groups in India. Okay, so we have some best they're, they're, they're the, people to learn from. They're the best uh, example, largest example probably in history of participatory democracy. And they're uh, smart, knowledgeable, not very well connected, but um, incredible amount of optimism and energy. Mm -hmm. They get my vote. Excellent. Maybe I'll take a stab at it. I think we want to do that um, on a global scale. I think everybody has to embrace it. So I think what's happening at MIT and across um, the globe where people are beginning to do, kind of embrace design way of thinking, we just have to make sure that we try to, to weave this, this delicate balance between what we need and then what the planet can give so I think if we build this into our education system and if we build this in the, into how we encourage our kids, I think we don't need to worry. I think the next generation is going to fix the stuff we broke. You are Optimism again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're ready for some questions. Great, from the audience. I see some hands here. I saw a hand go up. Right. One of our virtual audience members. Um, this is for Patrick. Um, they say, despite the decline in many people's interest in more information, we know the information just keeps coming. So do we need to do something with all of that information? <laughs> we need to rethink the purpose of the web so that it, the genetic code of it isn't gathering information about us to sell things to us and make the genetic code ways that we can quer make queries about the world and get different points of view about it. Um, that is not as hard as what Tim did the first time around in making the first, what was the first web and the second web. We, we can do it. Yeah. I mean, people in this room can work on that. Yeah. We actually call that Web3. Yeah. It's democratizing and decentralizing society. So start from the bottoms up. Yes. Get it right, ask the right questions, maybe get it right this time. But, but there's a great phrase, uh, information wants to be free. Companies like that phrase because they wanted to get our information for free. <laughs> um, people should be able to own their own information. So democratizing it doesn't mean that everyone gives over their information. Um, but I think, I think we can do it. We have a shot. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're at the center of it in many ways. <laughs> We're trying. Good. Uh, oh, great. There's... Is this on? Is this working? OK. Uh, thank you all first for your talks. Really, really enjoyed all of them. Um, you know, if I think of design empowering societies, sometimes it's helpful for us as a society to set ultra ambitious goals. And, you know, in you know, the engineering world, maybe that's 
sending people to Mars or, you know, some, you know, 50, 100 year goal that we can all aspire to and, and maybe get there, maybe not get there, but really use that as a catalyst to, um, you know, inspire a generation. What are, what is our design goal for, for the year 2050? Do we just get one? Do we just get one? <laughs> 15 years, only 15 years to get people to Mars, but for the panelists. <laughs> Sustainability. Yeah, let's go down the... Yeah, it's, it's sustainability for me, right? I think the design goal is uh, at a minimum net zero, um, but preferably uh, net negative, right? I, I, and I, it's, it's, uh, it's critical, right? The, the world is going to change. It's already changing. And in part, it's changed so slowly that you don't really recognize. I'm a parent, right? So I have an 18-year-old, and I can see how different she is at 18 from what she was at six months old. But the gradual transition from six to 18 always sneaks up on you. And I think the impact of climate change, even though you can go back 30 years and hear the bells being rung, um, has still sort of snuck up on us. Um, and most experts say we've actually gone too far to really turn back, which means we are in need of radical redesign of just about everything in terms of how we live, in terms of how we move, in terms of how we access materials. Um, so that, you know, if you, want, if you want a moonshot by 2050, then we really have to be uh, at a minimum net zero. Um, and to start to repair the damage that we've done, we've got to go beyond that. And it will be hard, and it will take everybody and it will take tremendous creativity uh, and perseverance to do it. So I certainly agree that that's the big challenge. I, I think of it as a global challenge. I'm going to take it down a level and think of design knowledge, what, what design. And I think it's the developing a theory of behavior, um, understanding the chaos of the behavior of crowds. Um, driven by emotion, culture, innuendo, rumor, lies. We have to figure that out. Mike, do you want to jump in? Robert, this is a great question. Yeah, I mean, I, it's a nice question. Thanks. I appreciate it. I, I mean, I, I think we can't, I can't disagree with a sort of regenerative built environment that's, you know, climate positive and you know, fundamentally trying to address the, um, the inequities that we've produced in our own um, in our own designs the last 50 years. But the reason I talk about, the reason I've been really interested in this notion of breathing is because the, one of the problems of talking about climate change and stuff that, that, and issues of that scale is it's really hard for us to see in our everyday life how we can connect to it and what we can do about it. And the pandemic really revealed to me that all of those issues are, are actually right in our body every second of the day. Like if we think about our breathing as a physical act that's being, shaped by the spaces around us. We might be motivated to take action in a much more aggressive way about how we have agency over the world around us. And therefore, at that scale of the body, it becomes the scale of the city block. It then goes to the scale of the region. And it all binds together with what we breathe. So for me, um, breathability is, a, is a, it's like a Trojan horse into the issues of, of climate change and into the issues of more sustainable communities because we can actually do something about it and we feel it. If we don't feel it, we die. Just try not doing it for a couple minutes. Exactly. <laughs> How that goes. Um, thank you for your question. It was a fantastic question. Um, I, of course, agree with everything that has been said. Maybe just want to add is um, I would envision design to become a core skill set alongside of math and all the other stuff. So design becomes the way of life, how we engage problems, how we design the world around us. And it's not an outlier. It becomes a core skill set. And uh, make the world work for 100% of humanity, right? That's, that's the goal, as Bucky gave us. So other questions? We have some other hands. Great. OK, one here first. Uh -huh. So, so I, I think that may, you may have given some of the answer to my question, but I'm kind of thinking, um, what is the role of disruption? Is it at the core of design thinking and design, especially after we experienced um, you know, the pandemic and all the inequities that have been thrown up? 
Yeah. Another great question. You're awesome. So the role of disruption, anyone want to take that? I think it's, I think it's a consequence of teams that either try or by stumbling around come up with something that the current establishment doesn't like. Um, I think it's also a um, cliche along with strategy and um, systems thinking and, um, and all the other cliches of the time. Clayton Christensen had a very clear view of what it is, which, which is um, what these random engineers would do on their own time. They couldn't get the big company to accept, and the, so they'd go off and do it on themselves. That's been going on a long time. And I don't think anyone can set out to do it, but maybe I could be wrong on that. Maybe I can pick up on this one as well. I think it's actually a really important question because like I was trying to, to convey, a lot of the people we have been talking about to these things is this ability to be able to flow with complexity rather than to fight it. So seeing disruption as an uh, everyday Tuesday event. And that's kind of, I think, where design can actually help, both because of the creative thinking, but also more importantly, because the ability of designers not to freak out <laughs> if they don't know the answer. Because it's the nature of the process of design to discover and question and ask and iterate. So I think designers and the way of approaching problem solving through design kind of allows for that level of comfort, if you will, uh, as you, you live with disruption. And then, of course, having the freedom to be creative breeds disruption, I think, in a way. In a way, designers repair disruptive pain. Disruption occurs. Designers come in and tame the new. I think my question may go to some of what you've already talked about, but I'm, I'm interested in the balance. Um, as an engineer, I was always taught about constraints, and there's also the mixture in there of innovation. We talked about disruption. We talk Every problem has a different mix of those things, right? Some problems are incremental. Um, I love the term adjacent possible. You just need to get from here to there. Some problems really require complete rethinking. For the whole panel or, or any one or two of you who want to give an example, when you're starting uh, a new problem, how quickly do you determine how much of that is incremental and how much of it's going to be need creative? And how much do you mix your teams up so that you get the right inputs there? Because some people are just naturally bigger thinkers than others. That doesn't mean they're better. Some people are really great incrementalists. Uh, how do you build a team? How do you define that problem? And how early do you need to, to make those choices? Yeah, I'd love to. Chris, do you want to? Well, I, a lot of I have graduate students. <laughs> and I keep them until they graduate. <laughs> So, so, so I, I don't, I don't do much, much um, mixing and matching in that way. But what I have often done is to craft the composition of my research group to bring in not just engineers but also scientists, because I do think that different backgrounds lead to different ways of thinking, um, and actually lead to different assumptions around constraints. Right. So, so certain constraints are irrefutable. Mass is conserved. Energy is conserved, right? Those are, those are laws that you can't break no matter how big the fine is. Um, but there are other constraints that are constraints based on your training and constraints based on what you believe to be true according to your education thus far. And so what I have found is that having teams that bring in people who come from both the engineering world and the science world uh, allows us to think about those constraints a little bit differently, and it does lead to more, lead to more creative problem solving. And just think if we could bring in the artists, the scientists, yes. the engineers, and the designers, <laughs> then we'd probably nail it, right? <laughs> then we'd probably have the most creative teams. Please. 
my question. Um, thank you all so much. I've really been enjoying these presentations. Svafa, you, you mentioned that um, one role of design is to choreograph a path forward to a better future. Uh, Michael, you also mentioned uh, your superpower is being storytelling and uh, uh, defining a compelling narrative. I'm curious to, to hear from you all, what advice would you give to designers and to all those here in this room and, and on the live stream as well um, in how to, in, in crafting a narrative that will bring society towards a better future? We have a, a process where we take that whole view model, the circle that was in the last diagram, and then somewhere between half a day and a week, we work with very diverse people in an organization and take them through that model several times, very quickly, very shallowly, from as many perspectives as possible. And that reveals stories, it reveals criteria, um, it reveals whether what type of a problem it is and what path we should take. So half a day to five days, we can do the first iteration of almost any problem. Yeah, I, I might add, thank you for that question. Um, I might punt to um, the person I really learned about this from, which is Marshall Gans, who you know, um, teaches storytelling as a political act, as, a, as the social change act um, that might you know, uh, shift culture. And he goes, he talks famously, obviously he's at the Kennedy School and you, some of you may have studied under him. Uh, and I didn't realize what I was doing uh, was storytelling work until he unpacked it for me in, in a really direct way. Um, but he talks about every story must, for it to be impactful, must tell the story of self, the story of us, and the story of now. And architects are really good at telling the story of self. <laughs> That's the kind of Howard Rourke and I, I uh, or the you know, Frank Lloyd Wright idea of the architect, I'm a, I'm a genius, or whatever. Architects, I think, were really good at telling the story of now. This is mm. urgent and new, and we've never seen it before. But we're often not as good at telling the story of us, or the great buildings out there do a really good job of telling the story of us, like why it matters to all of us. Mm -hmm. And a great story does all three of those things, why we should care, why it's made, and, and why it matters to us. And so I've, I've come to think of buildings as, as narrative vessels, the ones you remember, the ones that you can recall the story of not just what it represents, but how it was made, who made it, who the craftspeople were that crafted it, why it was put this way in the city. And those are the stories that reveal that what matters about it and why we should care about it and why we should maintain it and protect it. I think Shigeru Ban said this, you know, talking about paper tube, you know, uh, emergency relief houses that some have lasted for 20 years. He said people take care of the things they love, even if the material is meant to last a couple of years or less. So I think there's something about building into our, um, the, the problem of the built environment is we don't know how to access it as the public. So if we can gain agency in understanding what, we, what it is, like we saw the streets during the pandemic, we can demand more of our built environment. We can tell the, ask it to tell the stories that we want it to tell. We could know what we deserve. And once we figure out once we know what we deserve, that's, that's dignity construction. And that ultimately is where architecture has its most impactful transformational cultural change, which is it creates dignity for people. And I hope I would just add, I hope, I hope we're listening uh, to the stories as well, right? Uh, Nature, uh, especially you know the vital signs are screaming at us. Yeah. But you know, I, I have the question: Are, are we listening? And, and I did really historically too. We need to go back to ancient wisdoms. You know, are we listening? Because there are stories that have been told, and we kind of you know we got blindsided. Let's go back to some of the ancient stories and wisdom too, to just make sure that we're continually listening and learning. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can add one thing to that. So thank you for your question. I think one of the reasons we kind of, although you can enter a problem by design basically anywhere, you can enter at any point. You don't have to start at the beginning or at the end, but you can enter it at any point. But we do say though that um, establishing this initial intent, if you have the, your essential intent, 
And it's not too specific. It is bold enough, so it's inspiring. It is vague enough, so you can change your mind. So, but having that ability, and I think visualization actually does that. So uh, that's why I think having that essential intent crafted out and then have the courage to iterate as we, as we move towards a new future. So the problem is always changing. And we just have to be very comfortable with that. And that is the last word. I want to thank not just our panelists, but everyone who's talked today. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. We're going to turn it back over to John. Thank you, Deva. Thank you so much to all of the speakers today and for everyone who engaged. It has honestly been invigorating, inspiring, and um, yeah, we have big ambitions. We have a lot of work to do. But could I just please have another round of applause for all the speakers today? So now it's my great pleasure to invite all of you to a reception in the Philip Sharp Room, which is opposite us, where lunch was served. We'll have uh, drinks and hors d'oeuvres. And then if we could ask you to collect your drinks, mingle a bit, but then come back in here, because we have a short speaking program, and we are thrilled to introduce the inaugural cohort of Morningside Graduate Design Fellows. And we'll do that at 5.30 in about a half an hour. And, um, and so please do enjoy the reception, visit with friends, but then come back in here within half an hour and we'll have a very, very short, uh, short program. Thank you so much. <laughs>